Yeah, I don't know it at all. It's a nice range. Okay. Well, it's the 22nd. There's one. Right. We'll sing a song with that. That's a
Good morning. Welcome to worship. Whether you're joining in at home or here, um, we're glad you're here. I just want to share with you uh, my usual uh, small print disclaimer. For those who have come to gather, we're asking you to wear masks. And we do that both for your own safety and for the people around you. Um, it's just as much to protect them as to protect you. And try to maintain the six feet separation between yourself and other parties in your family. And also try to maintain that when we head out to the parking lot as well. Um, we want you to participate in spirit. We want you to be enthusiastic about your worship, but we ask you to, to avoid the projecting of your voice as much as you can. You can sing very quietly. That's okay, but the more you project your voice, the kind of the more risk they say there is. And again, we are just doing all these things because we want to be able to keep meeting in person. Uh, we want to keep coming together the way we are. Um, so, all that said, if, if you are here, we're glad, but there is some risk in being here. We're taking precautions to make it as safe as possible, but it's not as safe as tuning in from home, and you're welcome to do that via our live stream through Facebook Live every morning. Now, we have a few other announcements to go over. The Presbyterian women are getting together this Tuesday, September 15th at 10 a.m., at the church, with the weather permitting, you'll sit outside and have your meeting outdoors. Bring a lawn chair uh, and a surfaced uh, a tray or a lap board or something to write on. You're going to celebrate the Presbyterian Women's Birthday and have the first meeting of the fall. Wear a mask, practice social distance, but that's a good meeting. This is the first time I think the Presbyterian women have gotten together since this all started. Today, we are taking communion, so you're invited to stay. This will be after the worship service. We will gather outdoors in the parking lot in the shade, uh, and we'll take communion together, and we'll have a little bit more music. And if you didn't bring your own elements, we have pre-sealed packages of communion for you. So a little piece of cracker and the juice so you can use that if you didn't bring it. So everyone's welcome to say it's the Lord's table. You're all invited. Uh, and we're also looking for a soundboard helper. Um, so if you're interested in learning, our soundboard technician for many, many years, faithful David Swanson, he may not be with us for much longer. He's planning on moving, so we need to train somebody to take his place. If you're willing to do that job, we will train you to do it. We'll teach you how. It's a useful skill, and it'd be a great way for you to serve your church. September 15th. For the Presbyterian women. Yep. All right. With that, um, let's come together in a time of prayer, and we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us. We thank you for all that you've done. This is an opportunity, and to come together is a pleasure that we no longer take for granted. It's hard to be together, to be in each other's presence so we thank you for that. We ask that you would unite us together through your spirit with those who are here and those who are playing it extra safe and staying home. Lord, connect us, make us feel your presence, that we are brothers and sisters belonging to you. Open our hearts and minds as we worship to experience your presence and to hear your word. Shape us and guide us to be more faithful disciples. We lift up all these things and we pray for those who are grieving, those who are sick. And we pray for this world, for its peace and for its justice. We lift up to you Matt Macy, who is having brain surgery this Wednesday. We pray that that surgery would be as successful as it can be, that it would restore to him uh, some of his ability to speak so that he could spend some time interacting with his family uh, in these days. We ask, Lord, your blessing on the family of Dorotha Carlson as they grieve her loss. Dorotha passed away this week, Lord, and we ask that you'd comfort her family with hope and your Holy Spirit. We pray for Donna Bolas, who is struggling with chronic back pain. We ask that you would heal her, comfort her, help the doctors give her respite from the pain and be with her family who cares for her. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, and we pray just as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. kiddos watching at home, uh, 
please bring them up close to the computer or the tablet or whatever you're watching from so I can talk to them for just a minute here. I want to remind you guys that those Sunday school lessons are still available to you online. And for the children's message, I just want to kind of introduce what we're talking about in today's Sunday school lesson. A couple of big words for today. And the first one is obedience. You guys know what it means to be obedient? Well, obedience really just kind of means to do what you're asked to do. So if your parents ask you to go clean your room and you do it, you're being obedient. And it's kind of the same thing with the Bible and the things that God asks us to do. And following those instructions is called obedience to God. And that sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? But the Bible tells us it can actually be pretty difficult. In fact, the Bible says that all people disobey God sometimes. And that disobedience to God is called sin. And sin has consequences. That's our second big word. Do you guys know what consequences are? Well, consequences are really a result of an action. And the Bible says that there are consequences for our actions when we disobey God. But the good news for us is that God had a plan. He knew that we couldn't be perfect all of the time. And so he sent his son Jesus, and Jesus is the only person who was able to live a sinless life. And so that's what our topic for today is for Sunday school. And uh, I encourage you guys to talk that over with your families and have a look at those Sunday school lessons. And let's bow our heads and pray, should we? Okay. God, we love you and we want to obey your commandments. Please help us to do what is right and forgive us when we make wrong choices. Father, we are so grateful for Jesus and the sinless life that he lived. Please help us to follow his example. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Madeline. We come together now to pray a prayer of confession. This is meant not to bring us down, but to give us an opportunity. God is standing ready to forgive. And when we come to worship him, um, it's good for us to humble ourselves, uh, to remind ourselves that we need God, that as Madeline said, none of us are perfect. None of us are. Um, we don't pretend like we're better than anyone else. So we worship and we say, God, we admit that we need you, that we need your forgiveness, that we're imperfect, and we ask for your forgiveness and grace. So hear the call to confession. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, let us pray. Holy God, Heavenly Father, you formed me from the dust in your image and likeness, and redeemed me from sin and death by the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through the water of baptism, you clothed me with the shining garment of his righteousness and established me among your children in your kingdom. But I have squandered my inheritance, and I have wandered far in a land that is waste. Therefore, I turn to you in sorrow and repentance. Receive me again into the arms of your mercy. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who offered himself to be sacrificed for us to the Father, forgives your sins by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, 
You may be seated. As some of you know, some of you who are visiting may not, we are doing a sermon series through the Old Testament called Finding Jesus in the Old Testament. We're finding Jesus. We started with Genesis. We found him in the creation story. We found foreshadowings, types, figures all throughout the book of Exodus that point us to Jesus and what he would do. And now we're looking at the story of David, which in the Bible is told mostly in First and Second Samuel. We're reading the story of David together and we're finding those images, figures, and types and foreshadowings of Christ in David's life. Last week we did sort of an overview. We started with his death, right? We had his deathbed confession hit list scene and then we started at the beginning we took a bird's eye view of his life. Today we're going to look at David as a youth, as a young man, as a shepherd, as an artist, and as a warrior in the moment when he's recognized as being something special. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now the Lord said to Samuel, and Samuel is the prophet and the priest of Israel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there. For I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, How can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong? They asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab, he was the oldest, and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shimei. But Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes, and the Lord said, This is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Some of Saul's servants said to him, a tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music and you will soon be well again. All right, Saul said, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. One of the servants said to Saul, one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. Not only that, he is a brave warrior, a man of war and has good judgment. He is also a fine looking young man and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, send me your son, David, the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul along with a young goat, a donkey loaded with bread and a wineskin full of wine. So David went to Saul and began serving him. Saul loved David very much and David became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent word to Jesse asking, please let David remain in my service for I am very pleased with him. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp. Then Saul would feel better, better, and the tormenting spirit 
would go away. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we know that this charming, warm relationship between Saul and David won't last. Eventually, Saul will, as I said last week, become jealous of David, jealous of the way he's successful in battle, jealous of the way that people follow him. And eventually, Saul will die on the field of battle, and David will replace him. David will be the chosen king. David will be the one who rules, and he will be the one from whom the Messiah is born. God promises David not only a kingdom, but an everlasting kingdom, and that one of his descendants would be the Messiah. What makes David worthy of this calling? Why is David worthy and Saul is not? What is it about David that makes God prefer him and choose him? What does God admire in a man? Well, the first clue is that God likes shepherds. There's a pattern of God preferring and choosing shepherds. Abel and Cain, the first children of Adam and Eve, Abel and Cain, Abel, God chooses. Cain, God rejects. Abel is a shepherd. Jacob and Esau, God chooses Jacob, not Esau. Jacob is a shepherd. God chooses Moses, and where does God find Moses when he chooses him? Tending his father-in-law Jethro's sheep. David is a shepherd. It seems that when God wants to find a man to do his will, when God wants to find or choose a man to be a leader, he picks a shepherd. But what is it about shepherds? Does God just like the profession? Or is there something about shepherds that makes a person a good leader? I'm reminded of a story told by Fred Craddock. I've been reading old sermons lately. Uh, I've been doing my weekly devotions on John Wesley's sermons, and I've read some of Fred Craddock's preaching. He was a a great preacher um, of the last century. And he tells this story about an old man. He says, once there was an old man who had a dog, and this dog was his only friend. He was a lonely old man. He had this dog. They grew old together. And one day the dog took ill. The dog could barely walk. It was covered in some kind of a rash. So the old man took this dog who he loved, who was his only friend, put it in the car next to him and drove him to the veterinarian. Carried him into the office and the veterinarian greeted him. And the old man said, before I give you this dog to treat, I got to ask you a question. He says, do you love animals? And the veterinarian stopped for a minute and said, Well, Jesus says that we're to love God first, and then we're to love our neighbor. So I love God, and I love people, I love my neighbor, and then I feel like animals, well, they just think of them later. And the old man turned around and started to leave. And the veterinarian said, what, What's wrong? And he said, Well, this dog is my closest friend. And I feel that I can only entrust him to a veterinarian who is a Christian. And then he left. Now, I'm not an animal rights activist. I eat meat. But animals are living things, and animals feel pain, and animals deserve compassion. Animals deserve to be treated with love. That is a fundamental Christian value. The Sabbath law given in Exodus gives rest to humans and animals alike. Go to the next slide. Here's what Psalm 36 says. Man and beast you save, O God. How precious is your steadfast love. God saves humans and animals. And from Proverbs, Proverbs 12.10 says, A righteous person has regard for the life of his beast. Care for animals is a fundamental Christian value. And what shepherds do is to care for creatures that are weaker and more vulnerable than they are. And in that way, shepherds show compassion. Compassion for the weak, the lost, and the vulnerable. And that is why God chooses shepherds when he looks for a leader. In the whole Gospel of John, Jesus only tells one parable. Only one of his sayings is specifically called a parable. And it's a parable you know. It's the parable of the good shepherd. 
And Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And in the verse before that, he says something interesting. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Now, shepherds in this time would build folds of stone or wood or whatever was lying around. They would build that sheep fold in the wilderness to shelter their sheep. But there'd have to be an opening, a way for the sheep to get in. And when the shepherd would lay down to sleep, the shepherd would lay his body down in the opening so that whatever came for the sheep would have to pass through him. So when Jesus in John describes his death, he doesn't describe it as a sacrifice. He doesn't describe it as taking a punishment. He describes it as a shepherd laying down his life for his sheep, as shepherds were wont to do, putting their bodies, laying their bodies in between their sheep and what would hurt them. When Jesus dies for us on the cross, he is our shepherd, putting himself between us and death. We're told two other things about David. First, that he's a shepherd. Second, that he's an artist. He's a musician, right? He's good at playing the harp. Other than being a shepherd, that's the next thing we're told. He is wonderful. He's talented. He can soothe Saul's troubled spirit just with his music. But we know that David was more than just a musician, not that that's not enough, but David was also a composer, also a poet. Many of the Psalms were attributed to him. He was a writer, an author, an artist, a true artist. And why would God choose an artist? I think the first reason is that art is the one thing human beings can do that makes us most like God, other than loving our neighbor. What is the first act that God does in the Bible? He creates. Creates out of nothing. So when we create art, we are like God. We are imitating God. It's also not, not an engineer, not an architect, and nothing wrong with those professions either, but an artist does something slightly different that's important, and I want... I want to explain it. I want to draw this out today. When you create a house or a tool, when you manufacture something or design something as an architect does, you're making a tool. You're making something for people to use. You're making a means to an end. But when you make art, you're not making a tool. The purpose of art isn't to be used for something else. Art is an end in itself. You create art to enjoy the art. And that is God's relationship to us. God did not make you as a slave. God didn't create you to do something for him. God doesn't need us. He doesn't need you. He creates you because he loves you. He creates you for no other use, no other purpose than to love you and for you to love him. So when God chooses a man like David and chooses an artist, he shows us that is his relationship to us. God created you the way an artist creates a piece of art, to be loved. There's also something about artists that I've noticed, and it's artists, especially poets, are sensitive. They have a sensitivity to the feelings of the people around them. They have a sensitivity to nature. And they can, to some extent, see inside the hearts of their fellow human beings. And why would this be important in a leader? Well, have you ever heard of the golden rule? Go to the next slide. Golden Rule says, treat others the way you would want to be treated. But if you notice, that's an incomplete sentence. Treat others the way you would want to be treated, what? If you were them. Treat that person the way you would want to be treated if you were in their shoes. Because right? they're not you. And that requires imagination. To treat someone the way you would want to be treated if you were them requires you to imagine that you were them. And this is hard for us. It doesn't come naturally. Because especially for people who are different from us, we have to imagine ourselves in the place of another gender. We have to imagine ourselves in the place of 
an immigrant. We have to imagine ourselves in the place of a foreigner, of someone who is not like us. If we are to be moral, we must have imagination. That is why when God chooses a man to lead, to be king, to be the father of the Messiah, he chooses a shepherd who has compassion and an artist who has imagination. There's one more thing we're told about David, and that's that he is a brave warrior. Three things. He is a shepherd, and so he has compassion. He is an artist, so he has imagination, and he is a brave warrior. And we know from last week that it's not his violence that God admires. It's not how many Philistines he kills. So it has to be David's bravery, David's courage. And there's lots of places courage can come from. There's lots of motives for bravery. Someone can be brave because they're not too bright. Someone can be brave because they're reckless. Someone can be brave because they seek glory, because they're ambitious. But David's bravery, we know where it comes from. It comes from his faith. David trusts God. And so he is brave, so he can put his life on the line. He can go into battle and fight Goliath. Because he's faithful, because he trusts God. And there's something comforting, I think, here. And this is something I'd never noticed before, but I've been reading books on David. Never thought about this. It's a simple fact. But do you know there is not a single supernatural occurrence in the entire story of David? David sees no miracles. And God shows Jacob, Jacob sees miracles. God chooses Moses, Moses sees miracles. But David sees not a single supernatural occurrence, not a sign or a wonder or a miracle in, the, in his whole lifetime. Which means that David trusted without proof, without evidence. And so many of us struggle with that. I hear the stories. I hear people's private confessions of doubt. I wish I had a sign. I wish I could see a miracle. I wish I had proof. Well, David... The man whose faith never wavered, the man whose faith was good enough to make him king and father of the Messiah, never saw a sign, never saw a miracle, never saw anything supernatural, yet he trusted. And that trust made him worthy to be king, worthy to be the father of our Messiah who is our shepherd, who lays down his life for us, his sheep. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this chance to worship you. We give you thanks that in David we see the virtues that you admire. The compassion of a shepherd who watches over and protects those who are weaker and more vulnerable than him. We give you thanks for David's imagination, for his skills as a harp player that we can't hear, but for his skills as a poet that we can read. And Lord, we give you thanks for David's courage that comes from faith. And we pray that you would help us in those three ways. Be men like David, and so men and women after your own heart. Lord, we want to be like David. Give us his virtues, give us his compassion, his imagination, his sensitivity to others, and his trust in you. Lord, we are all of us, whether we are children or men or women, we are leaders. Whether it's in our families or at our school or in our neighborhood or in our church. And Lord, we pray that we could be worthy that we could lead with the virtues that you seek for in a person after your own heart. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll now bring forth our tithes and offerings, not like we usually do. We normally pass plates, but in light of the circumstances, we don't pass plates. They are in the back, and you're free to leave your offering there when you leave. But for now, as we listen to the music and we reflect, make this a time where you offer your heart. Offer your obedience, as Madeline said, to God, because that's what he really wants.
just forgotten somewhere. Where's the button? Um, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. Come Labor On is our uh, offertory hymn this morning. I love this hymn. I love the words to it. It is Labor Day, and we are reminded just as we labor for our families to provide food and sustenance, so must we also labor for our Lord to provide us so that we su suffer in his grace and in his bounty. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Lord, we thank you for all the good things you've given us. We count our blessings this morning and we give back a portion to you of what you've given. And we ask that you would receive it and use it to proclaim the good news of your love. That you are the good shepherd that lays down his life for his sheep. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn this morning is, My Shepherd Shall Supply My Need. This fits right in with David being the shepherd. And I have to say, this is probably one of my ten favorite hymns. The music to this was first published in the Southern Harmony Hymn Book that was published in 1835. There's no composer given, which means it's just kind of like a folk melody. But the most interesting thing about this is the words. Isaac Watts, he was an English, very conservative English Christian, and his dates are 1674 to 1748. The date for these words is 1719. Now the most interesting thing about Isaac Watts is he wrote over 750 hymns, and there are 13 in our current hymn book that we used. He was a precocious child, always spouting poetry, much to the dis disgust of his father, who frequently punished him. One of the things that is it comes down to us about Isaac Watts is when he was a very young man, he wrote this little poem. A little mouse, for want of stairs, climbed up a rope to say his prayers, for which his father punished him very severely, and he spouted back, Oh, Father, Father, pray, pity take, and I will no more verses make. 
Well, fortunately for us, he made many more verses. He was quoted by Charles Dickens and paraphrased by Lewis Carroll. So join us in My Shepherd. David, shepherd, artist, warrior, compassion, imagination, and faith. These are the qualities God looks for in a leader. And by the way, these are the qualities Christians should look for in a leader. And I have to say, too, if I didn't make it clear, I don't think the gender matters at all. In my experience, compassion, imagination, and faith are qualities just as, not, just as frequently found in women, if not more. But more than that, these are the qualities I think that we should look to cultivate in ourselves. We gather in just a few minutes at 11.15 to take communion out in the parking lot again. You're all welcome to join. If you're coming from home, you have enough time to get some bread and something to put in your cup and to come meet us.
If not, we have our own uh, pre-sealed safe for you to take and borrow if you uh, didn't bring your own elements. So I hope to see you for communion outside at 11.15. As you leave, remember to try to keep your distance. I know it's hard. I know you're happy to see each other, and that's good. I wish we didn't have to do this, but we want to keep meeting safely. Now, hear the benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.